And then I saw how I could be the buyer and I could redevelop the property and I could sell it to one of my investment guys and I could cut out a lot of the middlemen. And so then I just started seeing myself doing developments. All right, guys, welcome again to another great episode. Today we have Shannon Roberts. He is a real estate developer. He has done over a hundred million worth in real estate development. Um, we're going to pick his brain. Uh, he's done also a wide variety of businesses uh, from transportation to mortgage and restaurants. But today we're going to focus specifically on his uh, real estate development. Uh, Shannon, if you can, man, go ahead and, and take it from there. Let me know. Let us know a little bit about how you uh, started in real estate because I know you've been doing this since uh, 1999. And yep. let us know how, how did you begin and specifically how did you get into real estate development? Sure. Well, I didn't have a whole lot of choice in the matter. Um, my mom was a third generation real estate broker. Um, my dad was a general contractor. And so the conversation at dinner table every night was buying this and remodeling that and doing 1031s and selling this. And, and so I always, I always just saw deals happening. You know, my great grandfather was selling uh, real estate after the great depression. And so, you know, it was just in my family blood that that was kind of the pursuit that we took. So as I grew up, I just saw how you could make a great living by finding something that somebody else needed and selling it to them. Awesome. That's great, man. So did you, because I mean, obviously real estate has multiple variety of strategies. Um, what, what, brought you specifically to the development side and, and was your family involved in that as well? Cause you mentioned brokers. Um, but yeah, how did that specifically strategy get it, get you in? Sure. So my mom was in, yeah, my mom had her own brokerage. Um, I think at one time she had uh, about 70 agents uh, working with her. And, uh, but what I saw was I saw that if you, if you were a buyer's agent or a seller's agent, you were constantly looking for new clients. But if you were an investment agent and you were looking at selling investment grade product, you had a lot of the same clients because they were repeat customers because they were buying as soon as they had more cash flow. And then I saw how I could be the buyer and I could redevelop the property and I could sell it to one of my investment guys and I could cut out a lot of the middlemen. And so then I just started seeing myself doing developments. And one of the first pieces I did, I used not my first 500 bucks or my last 500 bucks. It was my only 500 bucks for my earnest money to put a piece of property under contract, to get it rezoned, to turn it into a storage yard, to sell it to a crane operator that I knew. And that was when I knew I was 21 years old. I knew I was hooked. I knew that's what I wanted to do was find pieces add the value and then be able to resell them. That, that's amazing, man. Yeah. I, I know uh, that that has to be exciting, especially at 21 to have the vision and already know what you want to do for the rest of your life, which is pretty cool. But then from there, so you, you spent $500 on machinery, started doing it. How did you, what struggles did you have to get into the business? Well, um, you know, everybody's got their own struggles. I think the biggest struggle that, uh, that I faced was just belief that as a 21-year-old kid, I could be taken seriously. You know, it's one thing to be in the business. I've been doing this for 25 years now. You know, um, I, I don't have the same uh, struggles, but I watched my son, who is 23. He's a fifth-generation realtor. I watch his struggles and, you know, uh, it's hard to take a guy seriously uh, that's putting together an offer to buy a $4 million piece of ground uh, seriously when they come in and they're 22, 23 years old. And so, you know, there's, there's the struggle of the legitimacy of being able to be recognized for your talents, regardless of your age. Yeah. Tell me about it. Uh, I'm 30 and I still get, you know, the baby face. Like, really? Yeah. You, you're going to try and buy this? So it, it, I, I resonate with that 100%. You have to kind of force yourself and force people to 
take you more serious because you and you can't joke around because if you do then you're you're still a kid in their eyes <laughs> yeah you're just a smart aleck you know uh yeah. one of the things that i told my son when he came to work for me is is when he was working in high school he had a job at men's warehouse and I told him, I said, okay, you know, if you're going to come into real estate, you need to be the sharpest dressed guy in the room because there's a lot of things you can fake. And a lot of people tell you, you know, fake it till you make it. Uh, I don't really buy that strategy, but if, if there's no denying the fact that if, if you've got a young kid in the room and he's wearing a $500 suit and the next time you see him, he's wearing a different $500 suit and he's really sharply dressed, that's not something you can fake because because quality clothing it shows and when you're when you're well dressed you're dressed for business and sometimes people get too casual in how they look or how they appear and they may be very knowledgeable but it's kind of off putting when you're trying to have a conversation about a 40 million dollar apartment complex with a dude in flip flops i hear you and, and you know that's our that's our generation right uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're, we're way different on that aspect but i i definitely see where you're coming from especially as the boomers start uh retiring and start selling off their assets right. uh us millennials have to be on top of their game so that's great advice right there for any of uh, my fellow peers who who want to go buy things in flip-flops because i know it's true <laughs> that's right so, moving from Moving from there, you know, how because how, I, I really like that that topic right there with your son. So you you're teaching, you're grooming your son to eventually take over your your business, your legacy. Is that what, what you're going through? Well, I you know I don't know what he wants to do. Um, you know, he got involved in real estate uh, at a at an early age because he saw that it it paid the bills, it put food on the table. We lived a great lifestyle, and he saw that there was an opportunity there. And he's gotten involved in the business. He doesn't know if he wants to be a buyer's agent, if he wants to be a developer like myself, if he wants to you know, be a seller's agent. He hasn't really decided what he wants to do as far as honing that in. But he has done quite a few deals. He's, uh, and he's trying to figure out where he wants to go with the career. And you know, being the, the fifth generation son of a son of a successful broker in a, in a town of about a half a million people, I guess there's a lot of pressure involved in that to, to be the best at what you are, because once they figure out who his dad is and who his grandmother is, everybody says, you know, expects quite a bit of him. So he's really trying to figure out which path he wants to take. I think he's going to stay in development uh, just because there's, there's more juice, uh, so, to, so to speak, in the squeeze on on a deal in development than there is in just selling a house or or uh you know piece of bare ground i hear you no and yeah he ultimately he has to make that decision so as far as you know development you know are you so are you part of the overall deal for the the, the investor are they coming to you are you or are you just finding a plot of land or something to you know, value add and then give it off to an investor and then you cut it loose completely? How, what, what is your, or is all of them? What, what's your strategy there? Yeah, all of the above. So I, I always have the strategy. I don't put anything under contract I wouldn't buy and, uh, or that I wouldn't want to own long term. I mean, there's some deals that I've done that I still own. Uh, I bought a piece of land. I developed it for an industrial park. We sold off the lots, you know, um, there's others that we, we kept the lots. We, we had buildings built on them. We filled the buildings with tenants. We leased those out. We own those long-term, just kind of all different kinds in it. And it really is kind of nice because I can figure out, I want to sell when I have a buyer. I don't want to ever be in a position where I've got to try and drum up a buyer because I have to sell something this week. And that's been kind of nice because when you've got people, you know, right now we're, we've definitely, for the last couple of years, we've been in a seller's market and that seller's market has had people chasing, buyers have been chasing two and three and four, you know, offers at a time. And there's been all kinds of heat on the market. And as long as you're in the, in the driver's seat on that, and you're the, you're the one that's in control, it really helps you to get the best price and the best terms out of whatever it is you happen to be selling at the time. You know, as far as, cause I find that really interesting that you were 21 and you've been able to develop 
so much over these years, you know, what, what would you say to people to, how would you get started in real estate development itself? Like what, what you know, other tools other than $500 to go buy machinery? What, what would you say? Well, what I did was I used that $500 to put an option on a piece of ground and tie up a piece of ground that I went and rezoned and sold to a guy with the machinery. He had the, he had the storage yard and uh, I just got the contract written. But you know, the thing that I would tell a new person, anybody in real estate is find a mentor, you know, find a, find a, an experienced agent that you can be their gopher that you, you know, people don't want to work for free and I'm not saying you should work for free, but if you can find someone that will, that will show you their ropes and, and will help mentor you, you will go so much farther because you'll get to learn from professionals that are doing deals all the time, instead of trying to create your own clientele and cloth from the bottom. And then you'll be associated with people that are known in the market to be movers and shakers and that guilty by association or uh, considered brilliant by association, they both cut the same way. I, I love that. So that leads into my next question. Did you, did you have mentorship? Did you almost work for free for someone until you learned the skills and provided value to them? Um, is that, is that your, how you kind of got started? Yeah. When your mom's the broker and your dad's the general contractor in town, you don't get a choice. If you get paid, you get fed, you get a place to live and you, <laughs> and and you, you learn it. it. That's right. So, you know, I saw real estate contracts being written at the dinner table, you know? And so for me, gotcha. uh, stepping into real estate school, I mean, I had to go to the school, but it was funny because I passed the test with a 90, I think a 92% and I never opened the book because I had lived it my whole life and I never knew anything different. And so I got mentorship even when I didn't want mentorship. You know, I got a, I remember getting a call from my mom. <laughs> this is funny. I got a call from my mom and she said, I, I heard from another agent that you're trying to do this thing over here. And I said, ma, I said, it's, it's, it's not like that. It, you know, the guy made it sound like we're trying to do something shady. She said, well, I want you to bring those contracts to my office right now. I want to review them immediately and make sure that it's not something shady. And it wasn't, but you know, she, so I was getting, I was getting uh, tutored whether I wanted it or not. And I was getting it forced on me because yeah. it was third generation and I was fourth generation. And, and we just had to keep the, the, you know, your name and your reputation in real estate is all you have. Yeah, no, that's true. Reputation follows you a long way. And, I mean, mentorship, whether it's your family or you go out and seek it, it, it is huge. I know we just got a, a pretty big mentor and I mean, they're leading us like crazy and helping us with so much. And you're right. That association opens doors, right? That credibility right. piece that you're talking about, right? You That's can't, right. Right. you can't just say, I want to buy $40 million worth of real estate one day and, and, and do it. You, you need some right. kind of help. So no, that's great. So you know, moving forward, uh, as far as, uh, you know, where you're at now, what, what is, uh, are you slowing down? Are you uh, <laughs> accelerating? I mean, the market seems to be changing a little bit uh, for some, right, in different sectors. What are you seeing? You know, I, I don't slow down. And that's the thing that, um, you know, as you grow, this is the beautiful thing about growing a real estate business. You know, my my mom has got clients that she's sold to the parents and then sold to their kids and then sold to the grandkids because she's been in real estate for 50 years, you know? Um, and I think when you develop a book of business, it changes, right? I remember back in 2008 when the sky was falling and what a lot of people forgot was there's people were buying houses on the way up and they're buying houses on the way down. All you're looking for as a realtor is to put yourself in front of buyers so or sellers, right? So, so it doesn't matter. There's people that bought their house 30 years ago that for whatever reason are selling in a bad market or a good market or a sideways market. It doesn't matter. And I think too often people try and gauge the market as the reason that they're in the business or out of the business. And that's where you've got to just kind of sell out to the business and create the book of business that 
you're calling people and going, hey, listen, I know the market is bad. I know things aren't great, but the reality is the real estate deals are still fantastic. The short sales are amazing. You know, we've got the new economy now with, with COVID and all of the things that are going on with that, but we have two and a half and 3% interest rates. You know, there's always something to sell. There's always some upside to bring to the market. And when people look at it and go, you know, there's this reason for not buying, but there's also all these reasons for selling. And I think that once you've developed your book of business, like I have with my investment clients, it doesn't matter whether the market's going up or down. You still got guys that are, they're trying to sell. You still got guys that are trying to buy and you just got to get in front of the right ones and not get worried about the ones that tell you no. Oh, that's, that's great advice right there. So how are your, I mean, obviously it sounds like you're still going at it and I, I love your mentality about it. How are your investors feeling about it? Are they, are they in tune with what you're saying too? Yeah. You know, the, the reality is um, there's, there's different levels of investors. There's the beginners uh, out there that, you know, they're buying their first house hack, you know, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're, they're doing a fix and flip. They're, they're kind of new to the market or they're, or they're just getting started. And, and a, and a market like this will, will tend to scare people. But the reality is, I don't know how, I mean, like I said, our, our town's about 500,000 people. And this year, we will graduate about 5,000 high schoolers. So we have all these new fish that are looking for houses. Some of them, a third of them are going to go to college. A third of them are still going to live in their parents' basement. But a third of them are going to look for a place to live. And with that mentality, there's always, there's always something to sell. And so what you need to look at is you need to look at the way the market is because there's always going to be people needing more housing. And we're not in a position like we were in 2008 where we had a six-month supply of housing. See, you got to remember a normal real estate market is a six-month supply. We don't even have here in Idaho right now, we don't have a two-month supply. Um, and so until we get to an equilibrium of a six-month supply, we still haven't stepped back over into buyer's territory. And then you're going to have people that are going to want to move out of the market because of the pandemic that happened. And you've got people that are going to want to move into your market because of the pandemic that just happened. And so again, you need to focus your energy on finding the people that want the service that you have, not finding the excuses as to why you don't have a sale today. Yeah. No, absolutely. Great, great points there. Uh, so as far as, yeah, I can see the market, the market is, you know, you can't just be dependent in and out whenever the market changes. Definitely agree. There's definitely opportunities when that in both sides, either way. So you can't, you can't just slow down. You have to keep going. So what kind of, what kind of, I guess, processes and business and, and yeah, processes in your business can you share with us as far as, you know, development and finding the right deal? Uh, you know, how do you find your your plot of land or your actual uh, asset that you're going to, re, you know, value add, redevelop? Uh, how, do, how do you go through that analysis? You know, I think it's, I think it's similar for all agents. Um, in my particular case, you know, you get the group that you're used to dealing with, you know. Um, it, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, that, uh, reality series storage wars, you know, where everybody shows up at the auction and it's all the same cast of characters, you know, but when a new piece of land comes on the market, it's the same group of guys that are looking at it. It's the same people that are talking to the city. It's, uh, you know, but you get your network, you build your trusted value of, of clients, of people, of people over at the city that you can get information from, architects and engineers. You know, you've got your core people around you that it's always the same cast of characters so that when you find a deal, when you find a piece of land or you find a value add situation where you've got some rundown apartments or you've got a warehouse that needs to be revamped and released, you know who to go to where you can get some quick analysis on what you need to do to it you can get some quick information on how to how to turn it around, what it would be worth when it's done, so that you can make quick decisions and put things under contract to get moving to the next steps. And so it's about building that network of people that do other things, not, not hanging out with everybody that does the same thing as you, 
but hanging out or, or being associated with people that do other things that can be part of your network so you can make those decisions quick and get done. Man, that's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's good points. Uh, so let me ask you this. We always like to ask people, you know, because obviously the real estate is not easy. Um, and, you, you know, you have to have a balance with it, especially if you have a family, if you, you know, how to juggle everything. Uh, what do you do to have that work family balance uh, that way? You know, your family still is like their priority. I, I, I'm guessing it's a little bit easier for you guys because everyone in your family is in real estate, <laughs> which I love. So yeah. how, how do you guys, maybe how do you guys get away from real estate from time to time? You know, well, you don't. Be- it, you, you travel to another city and you look at real estate in another city. You know, you, you <laughs> swing by, the first thing you do is you, you stop at the real estate office and pick up what we call a dirty magazine that has all the listings in it. <laughs> but You know, know, I think that the biggest thing when someone is starting out in real estate is is to understand the expectation, right? So if you're going to be working with buyers all the time, um, you're going to be showing a lot of properties at nights and weekends, you know. And as long as your family is aware of that, and your your spouse and your partner and and everybody in your life is like, hey, listen, we know that it's breakfast with dad that we get; it's not dinner, you know. We know that Saturdays, dad's showing property. We understand that, but Sundays is our day or Friday or Wednesday. It doesn't really matter. You know, I have a friend who his, his kids love it because they always get to go to the, to the fun places, the matinee movie on a Tuesday, you know, because that's their time. And you just have to make sure that you're on the same page with your family members as to when your downtime is because depending on what your clients want, most people want to work, you know, they work eight to five and then they want to see real estate nights and weekends. And so you've got to make sure that you're unplugging and doing your things Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. for your family so that you're able to, to live your life and not let real estate control your life and always feel like your weekends are full. You don't have time for your family. You need to make the time. Otherwise, your family's going to find a new provider they're gonna you know they're gonna they're gonna get bitter about it because they're not gonna see you and you're gonna you're gonna miss that time you just need to make that a priority i love it man yeah it, you gotta prioritize family you know i, I always like to ask that because uh you know a lot of real estate guys you know they claim oh i, I do amazing but you know not i don't like it when obviously it's everyone's choice but when you sacrifice your family that i mean that takes a toll well, and, we- we get into this business to provide for them. And the, the whole thing that we try to do is provide a life, but sometimes we forget to be, we got to be a part of that life. You know, yeah. we got, I mean, they're the ones that they want to, we're, we're the one they want to go to the water park with, you know, we're the one they want to go to the movie with. They don't want to just be able to go to the water park because we were able to work hard enough to buy them a season pass, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I hear you. Well, Shannon, uh, wrapped, wrapping this up, you know, Go ahead and tell the listeners where can they find you? Uh, how can they reach you? Yeah. Uh, so you get you guys can find me at shannonrobnet.com or you can find me uh, on all the normal platforms, Shannon Robnet on Facebook. Uh, Instagram is Shannon Ray Robnet. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm at. I'm hanging out there, but it was a pleasure to be on your show. I really appreciate it. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. And for you listeners out there, Uh, If you haven't yet, go ahead and uh, give us an awesome review on iTunes and we're out. We really appreciate you for coming on, Shannon. Thank you so much, man. Thank you.